Welcome to Fairhaven High School. I'm Bob Foster, the president of the Fairhaven High School Alumni Association and a proud graduate of the class of 1966. I'm here today to take you on a video tour of Fairhaven High School. Now behind me, you can see the addition to Fairhaven High School, which was put in 25 years ago to the original 1906 building. That clock tower that you see is part of the Henry Huddleston Rogers building that he gifted to the town in 1906. Today I'm gonna to take you through the original building and show you some of the terrific architecture and some of the features that make this the most beautiful high school in America. They broke ground in April 1905 and this school was dedicated on April 11th, 1906, and it served as the high school ever since. Back in these days, there were no building permits, there were no building inspectors, there was no minimum wage, there was no 40-hour work week, there was no overtime pay. A builder such as Rogers, in this case, he could build whatever he wanted. Now, he hired an architect who he had used before on the town hall and the Millicent Library and the Unitarian Church, and that architect was Charles Brigham. He was from Watertown, Massachusetts, and he was a very well-known architect. He had actually built Rogers Mansion in the 1890s. So Rogers used him for all of his buildings in Fairhaven except for the Rogers School. So when Charles Brigham got the job, when Rogers hired him to build the school, he told him that there was no budget. He wanted it to be the most beautiful high school in America. And he also had a few requirements and he wanted the architect to work with his good friend, Thomas Tripp, who had gone to school with Rogers and was the chairman of the Fayette School Committee. And we think that you'll see along the way that uh, Tripp did quite a job advising. Of course, when we've got no budget, that's probably an advantage to have for an architect that's given marching orders like Rogers gave him. When Rogers gave the high school to the town, there were several conditions to it. For example, the school had to always be the highest center of learning in town. Rogers had prohibited them from ever putting an addition onto the original building. And that, of course, was because the original building was built with no budget, with only the finest materials, with European craftsmen brought in, and he was afraid they wouldn't be able to match that. However, back in 1998, the New England Association for Schools and Colleges were doing their accreditation visit at the school, and they ended up finding some shortcomings that had to be corrected. So the high school was put on academic probation. So the school went through a process of trying to apply to the town for the funds necessary to put an addition on. Now, some of you might remember, if you went to the school before 1998, that out on the Lotch Avenue side in the back of the building, there was an addition. When I was here in school in the 60s, it was there. It was built in the 1930s during the middle of the Depression, and it was actually just built to add some more classroom space. It was connected to the 1906 building, the original building, with a tunnel. And the tunnel went from the old gymnasium underground to the addition. Uh, by the 1960s, when I was here, it leaked like a sieve. Whenever it rained, it was just horrible. It was uh, five gallon buckets of water that you kind of wove your way through to go to the building. To solve some of the problems with the accreditation issues that they had, they would put an addition on the building, but attach it to the building. Earl Flansburg got the job in the 1990s of building this addition onto the high school. He had a real challenge ahead of him. Imagine Earl Flansburg looking at this old building. He's honored to be able to build an addition onto it, but that's a lot of pressure for an architect that definitely has a budget that he's got to adhere to. So what Flansburg tried to do is have some touches in the new addition that would kind of reflect on or kind of honor the original building. Now, one of those touches was the rotunda, as I said. It's got kind of an English tower look and it provides a good transition from the old building to the new addition. But another thing that he did, he put some brick in the lobby here, you'll see, and you'll see some oak rails. Those kind of touches are also kind of a, 
a tip of the hat, if you will, to the old building. But when you go down the corridors of the new addition, it looks like any schoolhouse in America. You see cinder block walls that are painted beige, the drop ceilings, lockers. You're not going to see those sort of things in the old building that I take you through. Right, the area where we're standing right now was originally a classroom. This was actually, when I was in school, this was Mrs. Howland's room, English classroom. And you'll notice as you look around this room, the oak crown molding, the quartered oak along the walls, the oak hand-carved chalk trays. This is what every classroom in the old building looks like. Behind you was windows, just like you see to the left and right. And if you looked out those windows, like many of us did during English class, the football field was right out there. Now we've got the addition on the other side. So the architect, Earl Flansburg, had to find some spot where he could break through. The doorway we just walked through connects the old building with the new addition. Well, this room was an English classroom, as I mentioned, that I'm standing in now. It had a wooden floor, an oak floor, like all the other rooms. But what Earl Flansburg did was he knew that he was going to tear apart the old gymnasium. So the old gymnasium had a boys' locker room and a girls' locker room. And of course, the locker rooms had marble floors. Earl Flansburg ripped out the girls' locker room floor and put it in this space, and the boys' locker room floor is right up above us. And you can see this marble floor gives a nice flow right to the old building. And it does the same thing upstairs. Okay, now we're in the east lobby. We're gonna go down the end of the hall afterward to the west lobby, which is kind of a mirror image of this one. And what I like to point out to people, we're not used to doing it nowadays, is you have to look around for the detail. You have to look for all the little things that the architect decided to put in to make this building unique. The walls are actually Indiana limestone. And if you look closely, you can see the green in the limestone there. That's what it is. And you'll notice no graffiti. They haven't carved up the woodwork or anything like that. There's kind of an inherent respect almost for, for this building by the students here. Now we have a beautiful staircase that goes up to the second and third floor here. This is one of those things that I don't think I ever stopped and really appreciated the stained glass windows. They're all original windows. They don't have any plexiglass or anything on the outside. Never been vandalized. Never been broken or repaired. Now what they are, they're the original colonial seals of the royal governors of Massachusetts. So starting back in 1620, Eight with the first royal governor. He had that seal commemorated in his honor. And then when he was replaced by the next royal governor, he had a new seal commemorated. And they go in order, and you can follow the dates if you see the dates on them, all the way down to the lower right-hand corner. And the last royal governor of Massachusetts was in 1774. Now the ceilings are all hand done by Italian craftsmen that were imported. They came into America to do this kind of work, and not just on Rogers buildings here, but also in New Bedford. There was a, a lot of uh, mansions in New Bedford that were built, but it was Italians that did the plaster work and largely Bavarian woodcarvers from Germany who did a lot of the oak detail work that you're gonna see. Now I'm gonna take you into the original principal's office. The old principal's office is still used. It's still an office for one of the academic teachers. Notice the oak door here. It's about six inches thick, solid oak. They say that it weighs 2,000 pounds. And when you close it, 
it gives the room, it's actually curved so that you have this round effect along with the supply closet that's here. Door's not quite as thick. But naturally the bathroom is marble and you can see the marble sinks. The toilet up above has an oak water closet. You would pull the chain and the water came by gravity. It came down and flushed the toilet. It doesn't work, so I encourage people not, not to try to pull the chain. Just a beautiful space. Now this room is unique in itself in the sense that it's the only classroom in the building that's in this amphitheater style that you see. And when I was a student here in the 60s, there were wooden desks that were all mounted. They were all bolted to the floor here and probably were about 30 of them, I suppose. And the teachers had a wooden oak desk up there. There was no screens or anything. The teachers just lectured to you. One of the cool things about this room are the hand-carved faces that you see, and each one of them is unique. Some of them look like a monk. Some of them look like mythical figures, Greek soldiers or Roman soldiers. That was the architect's way of catching your attention. He wants to see if you're paying attention to everything that he put in here, all the detail that he did. know that Charles Brigham used a different style on every one of the Rogers buildings. Italian Renaissance on the Millicent Library, French Gothic on the Town Hall, and then English Gothic on the Unitarian Church. The school was actually built in Elizabethan style. What we're going to walk out onto here is the second floor of the indoor gymnasium. So now we're in the old gymnasium. Now originally when this was built in 1906, this is said to be the first indoor gymnasium in a circular form with a second floor running track. Now the track that I'm standing on right now is level and it's got carpeting on it. But before 1998, this was a banked track. And they tell me that uh, 32 times around was a mile. Now this is where the phys ed classes were held, of course, for years, and they also played basketball games. All right, girls and boys basketball games were played in this gymnasium until 1962. Kind of difficult to have a basketball court, a rectangular court, in a circular gym. So the backboards were hung up on one side of the track over here and another side here. But there wasn't enough room on the ground floor to have bleachers, so the stands was done up here. On this banked track, the custodians would set up three rows of chairs and you'd watch from up here. Now they tell me that back in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, visiting teams hated to play here because for one thing, the court was kind of short and also when you got the basketball in the corner, if you thought about shooting the ball, you quickly realized as you turned to look to the hoop that if you tried to shoot it, you're gonna hit the bottom of the track. So visiting teams hated to play here, even though the coaches would try to drill their kids during the week not to pass the ball into the corner, but Fairhaven's defense would be strategizing that way. They knew you were gonna do that, so they would clog the middle of the court. So it was a very awkward place for visiting teams to play because of that, and also because the Fairhaven fans, who were known to be a little bit rowdy now and then, were all up above you, kind of shouting and cheering from above. So it was a unique gymnasium, and there's a lot of great stories from the old days that old-timers will tell you about various games, especially against New Bedford High School that were held here. Now, I told you before about the problems 
with the accreditation that the high school was having in the 1980s, what Earl Flansburg decided to do to solve one of the major problems was to convert this old gymnasium into the new library. Now that would solve us several problems. And when you see the old library, you're gonna see how much smaller it is. You could probably fit that library in here 10 times. The doors that you see down, those double doors, those actually led to the tunnel. If you went out those doors, you walked through a short tunnel that connected to the addition in the back. Of course, once they tore out that addition, they didn't need those anymore. But if you went out those doors now, it will take you up to ground level, and that's where the beautiful Brick Park is. The Brick Park is administered by the Alumni Association. For $100, you can have a brick engraved in your name or a loved one. All the funds go towards two $1,000 scholarships every year, and we also support the after prom committee. But it's a nice, tranquil, well-landscaped area. Now notice the ceiling. You know, again, you got the English style, oak beams. And if you notice the beautiful chandelier there, that chandelier is actually vintage 1998. Because when Earl Flansburg converted this into a library, he had a completely different state lighting code that he had to adhere to. Now, the old lights that were there were not even close to passing the code, but also what was there were the ropes. There was a big contraption that had the ropes that would hang down, and during the non-class times, the ropes would be tied up along the rails here. And when I give the tours to people, some people uh, remember those days uh, not very fondly. They remember sliding down those ropes and getting their uh, hands or their legs burned on them. You also see the vaulting horses and the parallel bars, the uneven parallel bars, and that was a true gymnasium back in the day. You also see the basketball court laid out too, and you can get an idea of how small that court was. And the fireman's pole actually was used during phys ed classes. If the phys ed instructor had sent you up to the second level to walk or run, uh, when class ended, you went down the fireman's pole. That's the way you you went down. I can tell you when alums come in on my tours and when they see the fireman's pole, it starts a lot of stories. A lot of uh, memories are brought back. But this space is now used as a, a library and the new gymnasium was built in the addition. Okay, so now we're in the west hallway, and this mirrors the east hallway that we saw earlier with the stained glass windows and the stairwell. But we've got something unique here that I wanted to point out to you. We've got Henry Huddleston Rogers' bust, of course. This was donated by his son. Uh, he had one son. He had five children altogether. His youngest was uh, his only son, Henry Jr. Upon his father's death in 1909, Henry Jr. had that uh, bust commissioned, and that's been placed there ever since. This part of the hallway always reminds me of a story that I think you'll appreciate. Remember in the beginning, I told you about the school committee's problem that they had when they wanted to build an addition to the school that was attached to the school. Everyone thought that they were forbidden from doing that. And the reason that they were concerned about that is the Rogers Trust produces a check every year to produce $50,000 interest. That's about what the schools get each year. Now, that money is given to the high school only on the condition that it be used for maintenance of the original building. It's not allowed to be used for teacher's salaries or the football team or anything else. It's got to be used on maintenance. And of course, Rogers didn't really trust the schools to be able to take care of this. He did similar things to the Unitarian Church, the Millicent Library, and the Town Hall also. We had heard that part of the covenant was that we couldn't put an addition right up against the school. But no one knew that for a fact. No one knew where the covenant was. So when this all happened in the mid-90s, when they were thinking about building this addition, and the town voted to override Prop 2 and a half, the school department started trying to find the covenant. They looked in the safe. They looked in all the file cabinets down at the administration center. They couldn't find it anywhere. So this story comes to me from a friend of mine that used to teach in this room right over here. He was teaching here in the 1990s, and he said that one day he went down to the principal's office 
And he said to the principal, I understand you're trying to find Henry Huddleston Rogers' covenant. And the principal said, yeah, what do you know about it? He said, you don't have it. And he said, no, I don't have it, but I can take you to it. So what do you mean you can take me to it? He said, just come with me. And the principal rather impatiently came out of his office and my friend walked him down here and took him over to the wall right here. That's the covenant. Now imagine this, Rogers smiling down upon this scene from somewhere, looking at this. He probably was afraid that if he gave these people a paper copy, that they'd probably lose it or misplace it or something. So instead, he had a gigantic copy of it made and put an oak frame, of course, around it and put it right on the wall in the lobby. The language is typical legalese where it doesn't really say that you can't, but it doesn't say you can. So basically what the school department ended up doing was they approached the trustees in New York, the lawyers that handle the trust for the Rogers family, and they explained the situation. We're on probation, we've got some deficiencies that we've got to overcome, and the only way we can do it is by adding on and connecting it to the building. And the, the heirs to the Rogers family said, okay, and they signed off on it. One of the heirs actually came to the dedication that they had for the addition in 1999.
Okay, now we're out on the west portico, or porch, if you will. There's the east portico that's on the other end, which mirrors this. And even as we were walking out here, I had to tell the cameraman what we were doing out here. I never really appreciated this, but what this ceiling is called is a Gostavino ceiling. The reason I became aware of this was I got approached about eight years ago. I got a phone call from the principal at the time, and she got a call from an architects association in Boston, and they wanted to get access to Fairhaven High School because they heard that we had Gostavino ceilings. They sort of doubted it because they knew this was a public high school, and they found it hard to believe any public high school would have Gostavino ceilings. And I said, well, I give tours of the high school. The school department said they would let me in on a Saturday. I can give you a tour. We've got a lot to sh She said, no, no, no. We don't want to tour the school. I just want to see the Gostavino ceilings. I don't think she realized what Fairhaven High School was. I figured when they got here, I could take her into room seven and sit in Knipe Auditorium and that they'd love it. So when we brought them in, I brought them in by the uh, main entrance uh, to the addition. I walked them down past room seven. I kind of pointed to the room and she said, yeah, 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 where are the Gostavino ceilings? And I brought them through the door and when they came out here, they were just ooing and ahhing and gasping. A couple of them laid on their backs over here. Their cameras are just clicking away. And one of them got up and came over to me and he said to me, you have no idea what this is, right? And I said, well, I guess it's a Gostavino ceiling, but uh, he said, this is unbelievable. He said, this school was built in 1906? I said, yeah. He said, you have no idea for a public high school to have this kind of a ceiling in 1906 is just unheard of. He said, whoever built this school must have just had an ungodly amount of money. And I said, yeah, he, apparently he did. Rafael Gostavino was a Spanish architect. And in the 1880s, he invented this process and it's called a vaulted pressurized ceiling. These are all individual tiles, and what keeps them in place is the horizontal pressure they exert on each other. Now, this isn't the original tiles. What I showed them was the original, but what started to happen since then is some of the tiles were compromised because of the salty air here, and you could see that some of them were getting ready to fall. So we got a Mass Historical Commission grant that uh, covered the cost of this. Because of the nature of the ceiling, it was significant historically. We had a company come down who was a special company that works on historic buildings. And even when that company came, they said, this is unbelievable. They said, we don't get to work on stuff like this very often. But the other one, the other portico is the same exact thing. As some of you might know who have been in the old cafeteria, the original cafeteria on the ground level, that also has Gostavino ceilings. So another one of the unique features of the school that I know very, very few people around here know about it, even when you walk into the building, how many people look up and study the ceiling? We're just not trained to do that nowadays. Okay, we're standing in front of what's affectionately called Mrs. Martin's office. It really wasn't just built for Mrs. Martin, but uh, Evelyn Martin was the principal secretary from 1942 to 1988, 46 years. She was actually a graduate of the high school in 1941, right? And then the next year became the principal secretary. And of course, the principal's office was at the other end of the hall. This office was actually the vice principal's office. And the vice principal had a desk that was toward the back of the office. And when I was at school here, Mrs. Martin had a countertop. And she would be at that countertop. A lot of people said that she actually ran the school. But she was a great lady. There's many stories about her. Any alums that came through the school in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, they could tell you about Mrs. Martin because she knew everybody's name. She knew everybody's boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, she had all the scuttlebutt that was going on, and you couldn't pull anything over on her. If you came in late to school, 
Those were the only doors that were open. And God help you if you were going to try to get past her and just sneak into class or something. Same thing with the home room here. Uh, room seven we're going to go into was a home room. And she knew every student that was in that home room. Okay, this is the most beautiful classroom in the school. Henry Huddleston Rogers gave a few requirements to Charles Brigham when he was about to plan this beautiful building. And one of them, he asked Brigham to make one extra large classroom that was the most beautiful room in the school. And this is the result. The reason that Rogers wanted one beautiful large classroom is he told the school that he wanted this to be the home room for the juniors and the seniors. And the reason for that was back at Rogers Day, very often students would drop out of school after the seventh, eighth, ninth grade. He wanted to encourage them to stay the full length and to graduate from the high school. And what he thought was if the ninth and tenth graders walked past this room every day, and they see this beautiful room, they'd want to be a part of it, that they'd want this to be their home room when they became a junior and or senior. So that was the original reason for it. Of course, there were only 129 students when the school opened up, so you could easily fit the juniors and seniors in here. By the time I was in school, my senior class had 160 in it, I believe, and uh, so we couldn't fit us all in here. So some of the seniors, had to be in some of the other rooms across the hall, which had wooden desks back then. They don't any longer. These are the only wooden desks left in the school. You'll notice as we walk out in the hallways, there were no lockers in the hallways here. The lockers were all down in the locker room, the girls' locker room, the boys' locker room. So if you had classes that were on the first, second, third floor, you had to carry your books with you until you could get down to your locker. Well, if you were a senior and you had this desk, you could keep your books in this desk and you were allowed to and kind of use this as an auxiliary locker. So if you had a class up on the third floor first period, you could just bring that English book to your first period class, come back down afterward, put the book away and grab your math book to go to your next class if it was in this part of the building. So it was kind of a little extra perk for seniors that uh, made them feel a little bit special. But it was largely used for study halls back in those days, and of course for after session, after school, for students that were asked to uh, stay behind for one reason or another. Now, this room has been renovated a couple of times by the Alumni Association in conjunction with the school department. The Alumni Association has taken on a number of projects over the years. This was the first big one that we tackled in 1985. We undertook a project with costs of over $100,000 between school department money, alumni fundraising, and also Mass Historical Society grants. And what we did was we took all these desks out of here and we brought them to a fellow in Manapoiset who refinished them all. While the desks were out of here, they put staging in and we had some historical preservation company that came in and they literally spent the summer cleaning the ceiling and then repainting it, and it still lasted till today. We took the desks out a second time in 2001. Uh, they were all done with study halls at that point, and the desks had got carved up some more. So we had a fundraiser to have the desks redone one more time. And we put it out to our alums that for $100, you could pay for the uh, restoration of one of the desks, and we'd put your name up on a plaque next to one of the desks. And we thought, well, even if we get 40 or 50 of them, that'll help defray the cost. Believe it or not, within about two weeks, we sold all 102, including the teacher's desk. And it was funny because a lot of people, they said, well, I'll donate $100, but only if it's uh, for row six, number four. I want that one. 
I want my name next to that one because that was my homeroom seat. Kind of hard to believe that people uh, could still remember what their homeroom seat was, you know, 40, 50 years ago, but they swear that they could. This room obviously is one of the focal points of the tours that we do here. People always uh, marvel at it, and I usually have them just sit here and just absorb it. I spent a lot of time in study hall staring at this ceiling. And if you look at it, you can see the detail is unbelievable. The lights that you see here are not original. The original lights actually didn't produce enough light to pass the state code. The lights that had been put in as a result of the project weren't very historic looking, but they were functional and they passed the lighting code. But the Alumni Association about six years ago found these lights and it cost us $11,000 which look pretty close to what the originals were, except these are hanging down a little bit lower. The originals were right up against the plaster. Now, Henry Hollister Rogers, you can see him behind me. That's one of his best portraits, really. It was taken toward the later stages of his life. Very prominent businessman in New York, of course. Loved the town of Fairhaven. He spent a lot of time here every summer. And when he built the high school in 1906, he came back to town even more often just to check on the progress uh, of the building. From this beautiful room, I'm gonna take you to see the beautiful auditorium where he was very interested in the construction of that because that's where his dedication ceremony was gonna take place on April 11th, 1906. Okay, I'm about to take you into the Knight Auditorium. It was named the Knight Auditorium in the 1970s after the retirement of Mrs. Mabel Knight. She had started teaching here as Mabel Hoyle in 1928 and then taught in this school until 1974. After she retired, this auditorium was dedicated in her name. She was quite a lady, one of those really stirring teachers that uh, everyone respected. She had very high standards. She had a lot to do with the yearbook, and uh, every, everything had to be just right uh, to please Mrs. Knight. We're gonna go into the auditorium that bears her name now, more continuation of Henry Huddleston Rogers' work. Okay, now the Knight Auditorium, as you look around and look for the detail, you can immediately realized that this is another room that you don't find in many high schools in America. Rogers wanted a large auditorium that would be even larger than the 129 students that would fill up the school when it first opened. There's 381 seats in here. These are the original chairs. The stage and everything else is original except for the curtains. The curtains have been replaced. The auditorium features the gargoyles. You notice the hand-carved gargoyles? that you can see all around the room. When the school committee and the alumni association renovated this room in the late 1980s, this was our second big project, we took all of these chairs out of here and put staging in to get up to the ceiling. Again, it was all dingy. It really needed to be cleaned, the gargoyles and the whole ceiling. And it took an entire summer. It was around 1988 when this room was refurbished. And it basically just needed to be cleaned. The oak walls needed to be like polished and waxed. Uh, other than that, the room was in perfect shape. The person we employed back then to advise us on this work uh, for both room seven and for the Knight Auditorium, his name, I always remember it because it just had a perfect architect's name, Maximilian Ferro. And he and his company were nationally known as restoration architects for historical buildings. So we had hired him using the grant that we had and he came in and did a study of the entire school. And he particularly focused on this room and on room seven. And he did a presentation for the school committee right up here. We held our meeting here when he gave his final presentation and he gave a slideshow. And that's when we really appreciated the detail because in his slideshow, he zoomed in on all of these gargoyles faces. And you could see, he pointed out to us that the architect again was challenging us to notice all the detail he put in. So for example, 
on the gargoyles, some of their snouts are turned down, some of them are twisted up, some of them appear to be laughing, others look like they're very solemn, but each of the gargoyles is very different. We're not used to that nowadays. We're used to something like that just being mass produced and it all looked the same. That's one of the unique things about this room. And again, Maximilian Ferro is a restoration architect that's worked across the country. And what he told us in the mid 80s when he evaluated the school, he said, again, you people have no idea what you have here. He said, I've been in high schools all across America and there's no public high school in America that is like this school. There was a movie that was filmed here, and it's called The Holdovers, starring Paul Giamatti. And uh, the movie was filmed right here at Faven High School during February vacation. And it's a private school that is in the story, but no one would think that this would be a public high school in America. But uh, in the story, it's actually called Deerfield Academy. Now, there is a Deerfield Academy, but it's out in Western Massachusetts. But you can look out for that and see how much of Faven High School is going to be in it. But I think it's safe to say that there'll be some scenes from this room and from room seven in the movie. The statues that you see up in the corners, this is kind of a Roman style to have these statues in the corners, but these are actually class gifts. Most of them are gifts from the classes in the 1920s. This room is still used. It's used by the choral groups for rehearsals, and it's always used by students who are crossing through to go from the west side of the building to the east and vice versa. So next, I'm going to take you into the Batani Library. It's just outside on the other side of this room. Okay, now we're standing outside of the Batani Library. Any of you that graduated before 1999 would just know this as the library. It was the only library up until then. During the project to build the addition, of course, they converted the old gymnasium over to be the new library. So this room was then converted into a classroom. Henry Huddleston Rogers was the first alumni president in 1894. When Rogers died in 1909, the Alumni Association went into a dormant period. Mary Batani, who was a graduate in 1938, was very passionate about the school. She felt that not enough was being done to keep up the uh, historic value of it and everything. So she got the Alumni Association rejuvenated. She had become the alumni president in 1980, and she remained as the president of the alumni until 1998. And that's when I took her place and then continued in that uh, role. The Alumni Association asked the school department to name this space after her because of the great work that she did. She led us through those projects I discussed about Room 7, Knight Auditorium. She loved this high school and did a lot of unselfish work here. So I'm going to take you inside and now you can compare this with what you've seen in the library that was created out of the old gym. Hey, now the old library is obviously a beautiful room, as you can tell. It's a unique room in the school in one special sense. And you might be able to pick up on it by looking at the fireplace behind me. It's an oak fireplace, hand carved, as you can see. But the tint of the oak, the shade of it, looks a little bit different from the rest of the building that you've seen, and that's because it is. This oak that is used in this room is called bog oak, B-O-G and it was imported from the British Isles. And as you might imagine, it's very expensive. And the thing about bog oak that makes it special is that it's softer oak. And because it's softer, that means that the craftsmen can carve with more detail. So if you see the cherubs up above the fireplace and then all the detail work on either side of the fireplace, that's not intricate work you could do in just regular oak. Again, just a very special room and you see all the carving all the way around. The fireplace was a working fireplace. They tell me that back in the early days of the school, they had a silver tea set that was in the safe down in what we call Mrs. Martin's office. And on Friday afternoons, after the kids were released for the weekend, the teachers and the principal would have a meeting up here. And they would bring the silver tea set up and set that up. And they would uh, light a fire in the fireplace. 
and the principal would have a teacher's meeting to wrap up the week. Now you can see in this room, we're missing a couple of tabletops here. The Alumni Association this summer, we're gonna refinish all five of these tables. These two are being done right now. When they bring these two back, they're gonna take the others out and then we're gonna put glass tops on them to preserve them. They're almost 120 years old. They are so heavy that it was almost impossible for the workmen to carry these tabletops out of here last weekend. And if you look at old yearbooks from the 1930s, you can see they had a brass lamp. Each table had two of them, but those were gone years ago. But these four tables are the original stuff. Now we're outside of the rotunda on the second level, and where I'm standing right now used to be Mrs. Knipe's room. Down below me was Mrs. Howland's room, the English teacher, but this was Mrs. Knipe's room. So the marble floor that you see here was put in by Earl Flansburg. It was actually the marble floor from the boys' locker room, but he put it in here so it would blend with the marble floors that go out toward the Knipe Auditorium. Okay, now if you remember this piece here, uh, these were cabinets, storage space, that was in the back of Mrs. Knight's room. I believe that these drawers were actually used by, by the homemaking teacher. Now they use it to, to keep the plaques. You see some of the championship plaques from the sports teams. And you might remember, if you were a student in Mrs. Knight's room way back when, these uh, bust of Abraham Lincoln. Mrs. Knight taught public speaking as well as English. Lincoln was a model for her and her students. That is something that they kept. Okay, so now we're in the original cafeteria down on the basement level. If you were a student here back in the day, you probably recognize this, but the wall might look a little funny here. On the other side of that wall is Blue Devil TV, BD TV, which is a very successful student media program that they run here at the school. This room where I'm standing, this was actually known as the boys' cafeteria. Up until about 1970, the boys ate on this side and the girls ate on the other side. We could see the girls, but we were not allowed to sit at the same tables with them. And apparently, from what I understand, it was around 1970 that they were integrated together. The little housing over there, that's where you dropped your tray off. The lunch lady was in there with a few student volunteers. The window would be up and you would throw your tray in. The kitchen was off to this side. Notice the ceilings. These are the that same style of ceilings. So it's a basement level cafeteria in a public school that has got Gostavino ceilings all the way through. How much did this cost? Nobody knows. It wasn't a factor. Rogers never told anybody what this school cost him. Charles Brigham, the architect, he never led on to what the cost was, but no expense was spared. It's a very nostalgic place. Whenever I bring tours down here, a lot of people have stories that they can recall. They used to be in the alcoves back there. There were small tables, small oak tables that had three or four seats at a table, and that's where the uh, seniors would eat. Everything was oak back in the day. Okay, speaking of oak, I'm gonna show you one of the original lockers right over here. Okay, so this is one of the original oak lockers, of course. Little ventilation. You notice the size of the locker. You all remember the lockers you had in school. Pretty good size. You could probably stuff two freshmen in one of these lockers. Okay, I'm standing outside of the old cafeteria, and this is the china closet but the original China that has the FHS logo on it is the same logo that the Alumni Association has used around the school now to put it on the stage curtains that you saw in the Knipe Auditorium and also on the football field or turf field at Alumni Stadium. That's that same FHS logo. The old football field was replaced a few years ago by this beautiful turf field with our great FHS logo in the middle, and you can see the fantastic scoreboard that the Alumni Association, at a cost of $30,000, gave toward this project. We're very proud of the project. The, probably the greatest thing about this whole complex is the fact that this field 
is used by not just the football team, but by the boys and girls soccer team, the girls field hockey team, the girls and boys lacrosse teams. So it's been a fantastic addition to the complex and the FHS alumni is very proud to have been involved with us. In closing, I'd like to thank you for taking part in this tour of Fairhaven High School today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're a graduate of the school, I hope it brought back some fond memories for you. And I hope you appreciate some of the changes that were incorporated into the building. I'd also like to thank you on behalf of the Fairhaven Alumni Association. If you want to show any appreciation to us, take a look at our website, which is Fairhaven Alumni. Dot org. You can find a, a link to this tour, but you'll also find a link to many other pictures, photo galleries, and uh, news articles with current activities of the Alumni Association, as well as a link to our favorite high school hall of fame. We only do one fundraiser each year. It's our Light a Light uh, fundraiser, where the Colorado Blue Spruce Tree that's on the west lawn of the high school gets lit up. One bulb for every $10 that's donated. That's our one fundraiser we do and that underwrites all the projects that you learned about today and the ones that we plan to do in the future. So once again, thank you very much and I hope to see you sometime on one of my tours at the school.